I know that um, I know that this might seem like a lot of information, but I I um, I purposely made these videos not too long. They're only 30 minutes each to help address just the the real basics of the Bible that oftentimes people just kind of blow through. And we'll still get to we'll still talk about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We'll still talk about the books of history: Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. We'll still talk about the books of wisdom: Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. We'll, talk, we'll still talk about the pro the prophets with Isaiah and with um. Uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and we'll still talk about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We'll still talk about the letters, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, all that stuff. We'll still talk about all that stuff. But what I want to do is make sure that, that there's no confusion over the simple things that people just neglect teaching on. And I think sometimes it's because people don't understand, but I also think that sometimes it's because people want um, uh, certain rules to be followed in the church, and I think that the less people know about Old Test, the Old Testament, the more it's easy to manipulate people. So, um, whenever you're talking about the Old Testament, something always needs to come up, and that's called foreshadowing. Okay, now you might be familiar with this word, you might not, but as it applies to talking about the Bible, this is what it means: something that points to what would later be fulfilled. Okay. Now, I know that sounds a little bit vague, so I'll give you a few examples. First off, um, immoral leadership. If you read the book of Judges or uh, the books of First and Second Chron Kings or First and Second Chronicles, either, any of those, you see repeatedly, excuse me, um, leaders failing to follow God's ways. And that foreshadows... Jesus coming uh, as the perfect leader, and his reign will never end. Because that's one of the all, another one of the things that we see. A good king comes, a king who who genuinely does good things, like King David. Um, and then something happens, you know, and they die. They always die. Well, this one will be will be perfect. His reign will never be overthrown by anyone, and he will never die. See. Well, so that foreshadows the need for that kingdom. Now we understand the need. Does that make sense? <coughs> also, the temple or the tabernacle, depending on, on what you're talking about, was where the people worshipped. But this was just an image for God dwelling with, pe dwelling with his people. Now, God, de God dwells with us in our heart. But also in heaven, we will dwell with him again and walk with him just the same as we did in the Garden of Eden, how it was supposed to be. Does that make sense? It, the temple or the tabernacle foreshadowed God's indwelling presence, the fact that he would be with his people. The law. The law was given to show people sin and what righteousness was, but that was fulfilled with Jesus, who is the perfect sacrifice, the perfect priest. And we'll talk about that in just a second. I know um, if you're new to the Bible, you have absolutely no idea about the sacrifices, no idea about the priests. So I'll explain that. Um, I already mentioned that. Um, also, some things in the Old Testament, just a little side note here, not really that important, but I figured I'd throw this in. Some things in the Old Testament are kind of, um, I want to say, uh, hinted to. Um, if I can figure out how to show my... Well, anyways, I have notes somewhere, and I don't know how to pull them up. But... Um, um, oops. Um, in the Old Testament, whenever you're done with the Old Testament, there is um, Babylon. Babylon is a symbol for evil, especially as you get throughout the Bible. You see it happening more and more. The Tower of Babel was where the uh, was was where people were doing very wicked things in the beginning of Genesis. Um, I think it was after the flood, so probably around like chapter 10 or 11, I would imagine. Somewhere in there. Um, and in Revelations, uh, John talks about um, about Babylon the whore. And obviously he was using it as uh, talking about Rome, but still, um, Babylon just becomes a symbol of evil. And then Egypt likewise becomes a symbol of temptation. After Israel comes out, is rescued from Egypt in the book of Exodus, um, 
you have God telling them, don't go back to Israel, don't go back to Egypt. And Israel is always tempted to go back to, to Egypt. That's symbolic of the way that we always want to go back to the things that we know. Um, or Israel's exodus, when Israel is saved from Egypt, that's a, that's, that's a, that's kind of a, it's a, it's, it's, it actually happened, but it's an example to us of what it's like when we are saved. We're in a land that we can't save ourselves from, sin, and Christ comes and saves us. Notice how it's the the uh, the blood of the lamb that they have to put on the doorposts on the the same the blood of the lamb Jesus is on our hearts. Does that make sense? So I hope that that kind of explains things. Um, not saying that the um, those events didn't actually happen. I'm just saying that um, they are um, they do teach us object lessons. So then that takes us to the law. The first thing to know about the law, and this is in Incredibly important. The law was never uh, the law never saved people, and following the law today is not going to do anything. If you are circumcised, if you are not circumcised, does not matter. If you follow every single thing in the Old Testament that you humanly possibly can, it doesn't matter. Because first off, you're free from that law anyways. Now you're saved by grace. However, just because you're saved by grace does not mean that you should live as though lawless. Okay. Um, and I'll try to hit, remember to hit on this later, but um, we are free from the law and that we don't have to do the sacrifices. We don't have to have a priest intercede for us. We can go straight to the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. We can, um, you, you know, we're, we're open to that grace. And the Holy Spirit guides us and, and, and draws us and all great things, right? Um, however, that doesn't mean that we should purposely sin against God. For instance, in the Ten Commandments, God says um, not to worship any other gods. So now that we're free from the law, does that mean that we should worship other gods? By no means. And Paul talks about this a little bit in, in the book of Romans. He talks about, so should we keep on sinning then since, it, since we're not saved by, by those works? No, 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 because we never were saved by those works. Um Rather, we're just free from having to conform to the sacrifices and that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean that we should purposely live as a law lawless. Okay, let me give you an example. The Old Testament says not to get tattoos. However, um, tattoos, it's a little bit up in the air. may have been a thing in Egypt for some people, maybe. Um, it's kind of hard to know um, what he was talking about. It might just be talking about markings. But everything else in that paragraph he's talking about are practices that they used to worship pagan gods. Like he talks about trimming the edges of your beard. Well, I don't really have time to get into it, but the whole cutting yourself and all this different stuff, doing certain things, that was all about pagan worship. And so basically all God is saying is don't worship those other gods. Don't worship me the way that those people worship their gods. Worship me the way that I'm telling you. Seek after me. Trust in me. And so he keeps kind of trying to tell them this, and they kind of miss it. And that's kind of what Paul's talking about here in uh, chapter 9, verses 30 through 32. Um, what shall we say then that Gentiles, remember, Gentiles are anything besides Jews, who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? People who did not seek righteousness, they've attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But he's talking about being saved by Jesus. But that, but that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in, in reaching that law. See, the law led to the righteousness. It didn't was not righteousness in and of itself. Nobody could be saved by the law. The law bound people. Jesus set them free. Okay. The law basically said, "Hey, there's a problem." Jesus said, "Hey, I'm the solution to that problem." I hope that that makes sense. Um, verse 22 why why did the Jew why did the Jews miss it when they had the law because they did not pursue it by faith they didn't pursue the work the law that, that they were given Genesis Exodus Leviticus numbers Deuteronomy they didn't pursue that as if by faith they didn't seek after God they thought but as if it was based on works they thought doing the things of the law was going to save them they thought being perfect was going to be, be – the, they were God's chosen people. They were the righteous. So they were in the clear. They just had to do these things. F salvation was never through those works. And that's what Paul just said. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. And what was the stumbling stone? Jesus. Jesus is the, stumbl is the stumbling stone. Um, the law was given to stop sin and for spiritual guidance. It was also to um, – 
Well, we'll we'll talk. That's not for this class. Um, there were other reasons why it was given, but I'm not really going to get into them because it's just a little bit too much um, to to pay attention to. So instead, I'll just focus on these two aspects. First off, the, the law was given to stop sin. Uh, 3:23 says. Uh, Galatians 3.23, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed, who is Jesus. See, it was for a time until Jesus would come. Um, so then chapter 5.13-14 gives the second reason here, and for spiritual guidance. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's what I just said. Just because we're free from the law doesn't mean that we should live as a lawless. Oh, I can do whatever I want. Well, no, you still can't. Um, a true faith, and let, let me put it like this. It's not that you have to conform to a to-do list and a to-don't list. It's, it's this. If you truly believe in God, the Holy Spirit will, will reprimand you. He'll, he'll guide you. You'll be able to know what's right and wrong. That's why the the prophet Jeremiah says, I will write their, my law on their heart. See, once Jesus um, went to the Father, it was for our benefit because the Holy Spirit was sent to us. And now that law is on our hearts. And um, we don't have to have a book of the law because we know in our hearts what's right and wrong. What I'm getting to is this. People who are truly saved, eventually will be convicted of the wrong that they're doing, and they will be changed without uh, without people nagging them. See, we don't have to convict people. The Holy Spirit will. See? God has his own way, and he does it in a better way because he doesn't make them feel like crap. He makes them feel built up in the faith. He makes them feel encouraged. Um, uh, yeah, but that doesn't mean that we should... But then there are some people who, who pretend to be of the salvation, but they... They, they show by their lifestyle that they're not. They still go doing the same things, and it's been years that they've claimed to be saved. 15, 20 years, and they're still acting the exact same. They're still doing uh, things that are causing people to leave the church. They're still doing things that are causing people to, to doubt their salvation. They're not strong in the faith. They haven't grown at all. They don't know anything about theology or about God or about the Bible or anything. They're just kind of sitting there. You know what I mean? Well, that's a sign that they're not really seeking after the Lord. Now, I'm not going to say it's a sign that they're not saved. Although it does seem to imply that, I'm going to say that it's just they're not seeking the Lord. It's up to God. You know, he can worry about that. But I do know that God is long-suffering. I know that God is faithful past what He see, what we see. So, um, uh, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed, consumed by one another. Um, so what is he saying here? That the law was given for spiritual guidance. It was meant so people would know how to show love to God and to people. It was to keep people in check, but it also bound people. The law was founded on what? On the promise of God. See, God gave a promise that he was going to save the people. He was going to give a descendant through Eve that would bruise the serpent's head, that he would dwell in the tents of Shem, that he would, see what I mean? that, that, that he would bless all people through, through Abraham. That is what the law was based on. The law was not based on good works or on perfection or on human achievement or on, even on the human side of the covenant. It was based on God and his goodness and his perfection. Okay, God made the promise. I cannot pound this in enough times. The law was not the first. Because some people think it's, it was all about the law and then Jesus came. Well, yeah, but it was all about the promise and then the law was given and then... And, and the, remember, the covenant, the circumcision was given before the law, too. And then the law was given, and then the kingdom, and then the prophets, and then Jesus came. Remember that. So you will never be saved by how good you can be, and you, can, you will also be, and ne never be um, not saved by how bad you were. When you seek after the Lord and you trust him and you, and you ask him for forgiveness, no matter where you are in life, he forgives you in that moment. In that moment, he forgives you, and you are free. You are washed clean. You can then choose whether you, um, you know, if you if you truly did repent. And repentance means turning from something. If you truly did turn from your sin and seek after the Lord, you will still mess up. And sometimes you will go back and do the exact same things. But you'll keep getting up and you'll keep going. You may struggle with some things your whole life, but it's not your salvation is not based on your goodness. 
but on God. However, the Bible does say this in Hebrews, that Jesus is a sharp double-edged sword. He's able to tell. You can't fool God. If you are genuinely messing up, he knows. But if you are purposely sinning against God, he knows that too. So keep that in mind. Um, which is a good thing for people who are seeking after the Lord and stumbling, and it's a bad thing for those people who are pretending to and not. Um, so the law was founded on the promise of God. Sacrifices were necessary because of sin. Why were the animal sacrifices necessary? People always ask this. Why didn't Jesus just, just come way back then and then, no, oh, hold on. Let me get there. Sacrifices were necessary because of sin. You see, it was, um, the reason why they had to, um, in the Old Testament, why they had to do all the animal sacrifices and all that nonsense was because they were sinful. Um, God saved them from, from Egypt, but, but remember, without Jesus there and with them continually sinning, because remember, we continually sin. Even, at, even after we're saved, we'll, we're, you're still going to sin. You're not bound by sin. You're no longer enslaved to sin, but you will still sin. Um so the the sacrifices were necessary because of that present sin, um, present and ongoing sin. Um, but remember, the law was nothing but a reminder of that sin being present. It never washed people clean. Now listen to this: for the wages of sin is death. But in order that they wouldn't have to be put to death, God allowed the animals to be put to death. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. So then we turn to Hebrews 9.22, and this, Hebrews is such a powerful book when we're talking about the law. Hebrews 9.22, it says this. Indeed, under the law, almost everything was purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But remember, the animal sacrifices never, never washed clean. It was never one. Never, it was never a, a one and done kind of deal. Okay. Um, it was just well, this sacrifices were temporary because the reason why we couldn't just keep with with the animal sacrifices is because they were temporary. Because they were a stand in for God. They were never meant to be eternal. Animals can never. Why? Well, let me read it. It's in Hebrews chapter ten. Verse 12, right here. But, um, I'm sorry, it's verse 4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It is impossible for those animal sacrifices to take away sin. All it does is it's, an, it's something that God allowed for a temporary time to stand in until Christ would come. Now, why did Christ have to even come? Well, let me explain that, and I'll get there in just a second. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Done. Job done. See, because Christ... Well, let me... Let me... Uh, well, okay. So Christ is the perfect sacrifice. He's also the only one that can bring salvation. The only way to salvation from that same... The only way that that, that, that sin is taken away. Okay? And that's because of this. Christ was acceptable because two reasons. Number one, he was a man. There's an idea in the Old Testament called a kinsman redeemer. Basically, when you couldn't um, redeem something yourself, like you were in slavery and you couldn't redeem yourself or whatever. Um, slavery is a bad example. Um, you, Let's say you become poor and you had to sell something. Well, your kinsman could buy that back for you. Okay? Now, what that meant is that they were part of your, part of your family. Now, God couldn't have just died for us because a god can't die um and b uh because he wouldn't have been our kinsman redeemer he would have broken his own law but he could come as man see he's still god but he became something he wasn't while still being this exact same thing that he was he was still god before and after still god but he became man so he could die in our place and by doing that he redeemed us and he was taken off the cross before the sun fell down so that the curse wouldn't remain on the land. Remember, the, the Old Testament says that if somebody is left hanging on a tree, that the curse will come to come back onto the land. Um, and Jesus was taken off the cross before the sun, sun went down so the, the curse didn't come back onto the land. And then also, the second reason why he could redeem us was because he was also God. 
that that's important for two reasons. Number one, he was not a sinner. There was nothing. He was perfect, and so we couldn't die for ourselves because we weren't perfect, and we also can't redeem ourselves from something that we're in, we're in trouble with. There's nothing we can do to wash ourselves from our sin, and that's why nobody else could die for us either. That's also why an animal can never do it because an animal doesn't have free will or free choice. Okay. Um, an animal doesn't have. A, let me let me say that different. It's not that it, has, it doesn't have free will because animals choose like where to walk and whatnot. Animals don't have souls, so they couldn't. See what I mean? Um, angels couldn't do it because why? Because angels aren't people. First off, they're not human, so they they also couldn't be a kinsman redeemer because they had to be a human. But angels are nothing more than messengers, so they couldn't die in our place either. But Jesus could if he was if he came as a human while still being God because he was not a sinner then. See, he was still sinless, but also because God was the one who was wronged. God's wrath had to be satisfied. Why couldn't we have God just have just forgiven us and just let it go at that? Because God's wrath had to be satisfied. There is sin, and where there is sin, there is death. And God demands, see what I mean? Because God is also just and righteous, he demands that, the, that, that, well, that, there's, that there's punishment for sin. He, his, his, God's goodness demands that. So God's wrath was satisfied by God himself, the only perfect one, dying in our place, but who, who has also came as a human to die and be our kinsman redeemer. So it had to be both fully human and fully God in order for it to have done anything. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. A person can't die for your sins. You can't do anything for yourself. Um, it has to be God. But now that God has done that, see what I mean? So then that takes us back to this. And you see that sacrifices, animal sacrifices were temporary and that no, sac no other sacrifice is necessary because his sacrifice was good enough for all time and for all sins. Which means as we mess up, you go to God in faith and say, Lord, please forgive me. See what I mean? You don't have to keep getting re-saved at the altar. You're saved once you trust in God. You're turn you turn from your sins. You ask for the Lord's forgiveness. That's all that it does. Lord, please forgive me of my sins. I trust you for salvation. I know that you're going to be the one who's with me throughout all, the, all these years. You seek after him with your whole heart. You put your trust in him. The Bible says the righteous shall live by faith. And that's salvation. It's that easy. And as you mess up, you just keep seeking the Lord. It's not about your goodness. <coughs> but the animals were very much so temporary for a temporary time. Until Christ would come. So in the book of the in, in the law, there's uh, they use something called the tabernacle, which was then uh, outdated by the temple. And this is what the tabernacle looked like. First off, it was separated from the camp with this um, curtain or wall, if you want to say the barricade, whatever you want to say. It went all the way around it. Okay, it was not intermingled with the tents. It was a it was a holy place. Then they had the brazen altar here and the and the laver here. And this is where the animal sacrifices happened. And it couldn't be performed by just anybody. It had to be the priests, and had to do it a certain way. And different sacrifices had to be dealt with certain ways. Some they ate, some they didn't eat, some that certain people ate. I mean, go on, so on and so forth. Um, and then they had this in the court, which was called the holy place. And it was basically this, and right here the wall's taken out, but it was a closed-in thing, and it had a roof too. It's taken off so you can see inside. But there was this closed-in thingy here which also had curtains and in there there was a table then some candlesticks which which are symbolic of different things that really aren't important for us to get into in this lesson I, I, we probably won't get into that um and then they had another room in this in this closed in area so okay this does this court here does not have a, a roof it's just a court and then this is a closed in thing with a roof it's all it's all has, has the different stuff closing it in which is the holy place but then here in the back of the holy a holy place is another area which was closed in inside the holy place and this was called the holy of holies this was where the ark of the covenant was put and the ark of the covenant was a big chest which had um some of the manna that they had been given and it had um uh the ten commandments in it um or the the whole lie i don't remember at this moment in time um either way and on the top of that there was what was called the mercy seat which was a seat um, with um, two angels with their wings spread out over it, okay? Um, if I'm remembering correctly, it's been a while since I studied that 
part, um, so I'm trying to go from memory. But hopefully that will give you a good enough uh, image there. Um, and this is how God, God, uh, God revealed himself. Now, at first, God, God, God spoke to Moses from the mountaintop or from the burning bush, or you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then, as the Israelites came out of Egypt, God uh, wanted to be with them, wanted to dwell with them. So that's what the tabernacle was about. And at the end of Exodus, after they've built it exactly to specifications that God personally so showed Moses, the glory of the Lord comes down and 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 and, and rests there. And he is with his people. So that uh, let, let's break this down. First off, there's the priests. The priests had to come from one of the tribes of, of Israel. Only one. They couldn't be from any other tribe. And that was Le uh, Levi, the tribe of Levi, which um, was just where we get the book Leviticus. Um, it's about you know the different sacrifices and whatnot. So the Levites were the only tribe that could be um, priests, and all of them were, had, had to do the service. Um, they were not allowed to have property like the other tribes were. Okay, they were given certain cities that they could live in and, and different stuff like that and, and certain things, but they were supposed to be supported by the rest of the tribes, not by, excuse me, not by um, going and doing other jobs. They had to be committed to this and this alone. Um, I don't remember if that was for all time or, I mean, for, for all of Israel's history or not. I don't really remember. Um, they were set aside for ministry. Now, people always ask, well, Jesus wasn't of the tribe of Levi. No, he was not. He was of the tribe of Judah. But when Jesus um, died, he did away with the law. See what I mean? When, when Jesus did that, the law was put aside. It was fulfilled. Christ fulfilled the law. He did everything necessary. So then, um, as Hebrews tells us, that law was set aside. And, God, and Jesus enacted a new covenant where the law is now written on our hearts and we have the Holy Spirit with us. So who's our who's the priest now? Jesus himself is the priest who intercedes with us before uh, uh, intercedes for us before the Father in heaven. See, I mean, we don't need an earthly priest anymore because the the old law was set aside once Jesus had fulfilled the law and he, he is now in heaven um, uh, on our behalf. But he's also with us. Remember, he, he's he's everywhere present because he's God. Um, so then there's the great high priest. Now, this is one person. okay, And once a year, this person went into the Holy of Holies to atone for the, for the sin of the people and for himself. Jesus didn't have to do that because he was sinless. So he's always able to. He doesn't have to have to intercede for 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 his own sin. Does that make sense? Um, and so he's our great high priest, and he's always interceding for us so that we can always draw near. Now, this, this veil right here, um, excuse me, separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. See, this was the Holy of Holies. You could only, only the great high priest could go in there only once a year. But with Jesus, this veil is, is ripped. It's gone. There's no more, no more separation for us. We can enter in by, through Jesus Christ, who is in heaven as our intercessor. Okay? He's interceding for us, all right? Um, so, which obviously explains why we don't need any more sacrifices because he himself was a sacrifice and it was it was good enough for all time because he's God. Um, and then also that explains why we don't need priests anymore and why we're all priests now. Um, we're, all, we're a nation of holy people. The Christians are a nation of, 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 of holy people set aside for God's work. Um and what that means is that we can we, we serve God and we can do the things of God. That that's what that means. It doesn't mean that um, you know some people take that to a weird extreme. But God is the only great high priest who actually partakes of priestly duties up in heaven. Okay, we don't we don't do that. So, uh, okay. Um, and I'm not talking about revelations. It's a conversation for another day. In case you you are familiar with the Bible, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the way that some people. Take that one verse in the New Testament where it says that we are we are priests um, and we are a holy nation, and they just get all kinds of weird theology from that. Um, but Jesus is the great high priest, and, the, and we don't need a earthly priests anymore. Um, now, pastors aren't the same thing. They're spiritual guides, spiritual leaders, whatever, uh, for individual congregations. Um, and that's something that we definitely see in uh, the New Testament as they got more and more organized. Um 
so I'm not talking about that either. Um, we, uh, yeah, so pa I'm not saying pastors aren't needed. I'm just saying this kind of a thing with the animal sacrifices where a priest has to offer an animal um, is not needed anymore. Um, in fact, now to do it would be a spit in God's face because that would be, say, okay, Jesus is not necessary anymore. Um that's also why uh, I discourage people from partaking of the Jewish uh, uh, festivals is because um, – not all of them. I mean like the uh, the Passover and whatnot because they were doing the – they did the Passover looking forward to Christ. But Christ has already come, who is our Passover lamb. And so to um, to keep doing the Passover now that Jesus has already come is a little bit blasphemous. Um so I always try to discourage people from that. So then there's the tabernacle or the temple, which is this thing that I just pointed out here with the curtains and all that. Um, it was a sign of God's presence. It was the only place they could sacrifice. They couldn't sacrifice anywhere else. That was the place, and that's where God dwelt. Which, obviously, we can see God um, making himself known to the people, but we also see him um, a little bit, I don't want to say distanced, but... You couldn't. It wasn't as free as it is now. So now, with Christ, think of how much freer you are. You don't have to bring an animal to a certain place. You worship God now, and Jesus intercedes for your weakness. He 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 purifies you. You're clean because Jesus has made you clean, not because of your works, not because of how good you are. Um, and this whole thing is done away with. You can seek after God, and the, and the Holy Spirit empowers you and guides you through life, and just so much better of a deal. Um, which is, once again, what Hebrews talks about. Um, so, the only place I could sacrifice. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is what I mentioned there. It was um, where the mercy seat was. The mercy seat was where God spoke to them from. Um, it, besides, it symbolized the relational God. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? The law. The law that was meant to keep people... Um, to guide people to God. That's what the law was there for. Now it's it's weird that the law has become something that people use to beat other people up with. Oh, well, you've got tattoos and all these different things. I, that was never what it was meant to be. And and some people think that the law was given just to be a law. I mean, the law wasn't given for that reason. It was given to keep people um, from acting selfishly and from seeking other gods and that kind of stuff. So anyways... Uh, the Ark of the Covenant symbolized that relational God with with the way He provided for them with the manna in the wilderness. I mean, you can read that uh, through in the in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, that stuff right there. You can read that through there. Um, it shows the cut, the the the, um, the law was in there, so it showed that you know. But what do we see above all that? We see the mercy seat of God, where um, where God's grace went forth, and now we see that really enacted. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant doesn't mean anything anymore. Because this whole thing of the tabernacle is done away with. Now, God is interceding himself for us. That's the mercy seat now. So, I mean, Jesus is on the mercy seat, if, 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 you, if you want it said that way. Where we don't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore. We don't have all this, all this nonsense anymore. I mean, think of it. We're, we're free. And I don't mean, I don't mean this nonsense in a, in a blasphemous way. I meant... I mean, and, and we don't have to go through all these different things looking forward to something that would someday come. Christ has come, and with it, a better way. So I hope that there aren't any questions, uh, but if there are, always, 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 always feel free to ask, and I will do my best to explain. Um, and yeah, so I hope this really explained the idea of the law. The next lesson, we'll talk about... Um, the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, because we've just talked about concepts of the Bible so far. We haven't actually talked about the Bible itself. So that's what we'll start with ne next time. And thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.